Amen, amen. Well, what does a great leader look like to you? A great leader. What qualities do they possess? What actions do they take? In the home, at school, on your sports team, your dance team? What do they look like? What does a great leader look like? How about at work? Your jobby job tomorrow, when you're looking at the best leader at work, what do they represent? How do they come to the office every day? How about at school? The greatest leaders, what do they look like? At church, when you come to this church, some of the greatest leaders that we just saw, what do they look like? One of my favorite attributes, this isn't in the notes, this isn't in the intro, I'm just gonna spin it for a second. One of my favorite qualities of leaders is humility. And when I look at Jim and Penny Slauson, I just, it, they just drip Jesus. They drip humility. And, and, I, and I honor them, I honor Jesus through them. There's something that's, that's beautiful what happens when you see a great leader. One of the greatest leaders, I shouldn't say one, the greatest leader of all time is named Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I heard a definition about leadership recently. They just said this. They said, leadership is influence. That's it. And I was thinking about the most influential person ever, Jesus. I mean, for goodness sake, we, the whole world measures time around Jesus, B.C., before Christ, and A.D. Do you guys know what that means? Anno Domini. Is that how you say it? The year of the Lord. I would say that's, that's a pretty, pretty solid leader. If time is, the way we measure time is based on his influence, based on his life. And so I was thinking, if we want to learn leadership, I think the best way to learn leadership you want, some, you want to go to leadership class today, church? How about we just turn to Matthew 20 and just have a leadership lesson from the Lord? Because I think there's a lot of the world's way of trying to teach us what a leader looks like. And not all of them are bad. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But to me, the very first place we go is Jesus Christ. What does he say? If you're a note taker, I'm going to just touch on three things that I see in this passage about leadership the Lord's way. And number one, <laughs> great leaders, you're going to love this one. Number one, jot it down, great leaders suffer. Oh no, they suffer. Number two, they serve. Someone say serve. I think there's a lot of people in the world today, they want celebrity status, but how many of us want servant status? I was, I was just at a, a, a grocery store the other day, and I saw my man, his, his name, uh, I, I can't say his name, but he was serving behind the scenes the whole time. I happened to be at this grocery store way too long. I don't know why, but I was there for a long time. And I was in the bathroom. The dude was wiping down everything, picking up the trash. He had a smile on his face. And I'm like, that's a leader right there. And then I was leaving the grocery store years, or years, <laughs> hours later. And there he was again. And he was just picking up trash. And I was leaving. I'm like, man, thank you so much for your leadership. He looked at me. He's like, oh, man. And, and, and I just saw joy in him. I saw humility. And I'm like, oh, that's a leader right there. That's a dude that gets leadership. And yet we kind of look past that sometimes. And I'm trying to just climb this corporate ladder and try to be the man, be the woman. And that to me is leadership. Leaders serve. Number three, they, they sacrifice. They sacrifice. Let's take a look at it here. The actual section I want to draw your attention to starts in verse 20. And it starts with this bold request by a mom. Where are my moms at, by the way? I love y'all moms, bold moms looking out for your kids. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 20. Check it out. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. Now, before we get to the request, 
let's just talk briefly about James and John. You guys remember them? In Matthew chapter four, they were actually disciples three and four that Jesus called. They were part of a, um, their dad, Zebedee, trained them to be fishermen and they had a successful fishing business. And Jesus comes up on the set and he's like, yo, uh, you're gonna stop fishing for fish and I want you to follow me so you can fish for men. And they, by faith, left their profession and, and their livelihood, and by faith, they just said, God, if you called us, we're going. And they see this rabbi, they drop their nets, and they follow him, which is so interesting to me. I'm like, I don't know, where, where are you going, man? By faith, they, they took a step of faith. And then these guys, actually, the nickname, I love how Jesus gave people nicknames, by the way. He, he called them the Sons of Thunder, and there was an indication why. They're, they were rolling with Jesus one time. They go into this Samaritan village and Jesus was preaching and, and this village was like, ah, get out of here. And as they were leaving, James and John were like, yo, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and singe these sinners? <laughs> He's like, whoa, pump the brakes, guys. What are we doing here? Sons of thunder. Someone say thunder. Thunder, thundercats. Like these, these dudes were just ready to roll. And so... They come with their mommy, and uh, the mom, look what it says, she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. <laughs> 21, what's your request, Jesus asked. She replied, hey, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you. Isn't it funny? We just want to always be next to the, the person in charge, Right? in places of honor next to you, one on the right hand and one on your left. Moms, I love y'all, man. Always looking out for your kids. The request, save seats. VIP section in heaven. I, I want the boys to sit right next to you. And by the way, before we start judging these guys, which I was starting to judge them right away, then I was like, man, how many times do I try to do the same thing? We'll get to that, okay? But um, this actually, in my, I was studying this, and I'm like, this actually took some faith. Because earlier in Matthew chapter 19, I want to show it to you, you read this in your daily reading in verse 28. Jesus says, in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 19, he said, I assure you, when the world's made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so right before this request, right above it, Jesus said, actually, um, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm gonna die. I'm gonna be whipped, scourged, and I'm gonna die. So to me, this takes kind of faith for them to go, but he said he's gonna have a throne. And you know what? How about we ask first so we can get right next to him and be next to the king. Speaking of which, I uh, recently, I think it was about a year ago, I had courtside seats to the, next to the king. So I thought I would show you the picture of, uh, there it is. <laughs> there it is right there. <laughs> and I was thinking like, oh my goodness. And I was so close to, now again, this is not the king. This is a earthly king, but they call him King James. And I was so close to him on his right hand that I smelled him. You know what I'm saying? Like I smelled icy hot. And I was like, it's LeBron James. I smell his sweat and his icy hot. This is amazing. You know, like. <laughs> How much more to be next to the king of the universe? I don't necessarily think it's a wrong request. Who, who, who doesn't want to be sitting next to the king? The question really, though, is the motivation. What's the motivation? Why do I want to be next to Jesus? So I can get something from him? Or so I can smell his sweet sacrifice and his, and his spirit upon me? Those are two different things. But this is so wild. And so, I love this lady. Salome is her name. We find out later in scripture. Yo, Jesus, courtside seats for my kids. King of the universe. How would Jesus respond? I'm glad you asked. Look at 22. Matthew 20, verse 22. Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup? And jot it down, number one, 
of suffering that I'm about to drink? <laughs> Did you hear? And then what do they say right away? Oh, yeah, man, we're able. And, I, and I'm not downing that response because I think a lot of us, that's our genuine heart. Yeah, God, whatever you say. And it's zeal. The response comes out from zeal, but there's no knowledge on it. He doesn't know what he's, he know what he's talking about. So yeah, we're able, dude. We can drink the bitter cup. Let's go. Let's go. What is it? I don't care how bitter it is. I, was, I, was, I don't know why I was thinking this, but Christianity's not a butter cup. It's a bitter cup at times. We think it's just all Reese's peanut butter. We, we say God's best for your life, and people are like, oh, it's all going to be gravy. And No, sometimes his best for you is to go through a season of suffering, and then on the other side of it, you're a different person. There's something different <laughs> that happens. Suffer. Oh, we're gonna, yeah, we're good. Every great leader, by the way, that I've been around, that I've observed, has gone through a season of suffering. Not just gone through, but many times continues to go through. You wanna be a leader? You will suffer. Verse 23, Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. So Jesus is basically saying, yep, you will suffer just like, like me. But my father made the seating chart, so he's the one that's going to be able to handle that. I was thinking about that, and that kind of relieves some pressure, by the way. If you're feeling pressure, like you're trying to strive to be in leadership position, can I just bring a word from you, this, from the word of God? Psalm 75, verse six and seven, one of my favorite scriptures. This will put you at ease. Listen to what it says. Exaltation or position, power, prestige, the right seat, the VIP place. Listen, exaltation comes neither from the east nor the west, nor from the south, but listen to this. God is the judge. He puts one down and then he exalts the other. So, so it can kind of free you if you feel like I gotta, you know, I'm looking for that VP job or I'm looking to be the CEO. Here's, here's the thing. If we will apply Jesus' principles we're seeking first, if the Father has it for us to be in a position, you don't have to strive to be there. You partner with the Lord and he'll put you in the right place at the right time. He, he says, he says, boys, are you able to drink from the cup? And he says, you actually will drink from the cup. And the cup specifying this dicey part of their life, this suffering. And if you study your Bible, James actually, I think it's Acts 12, I want to say, King Herod Agrippa comes to power and James is the first of the 12 disciples to be martyred for his faith and takes out a sword and dices him up. John, if you study the, the life of John, his brother, he went through grueling, just suffering through his life to the point where uh, they tried to boil him in a pot of oil. And miraculously, he didn't die and so they just banished him to this, this island called Patmos, which, by the way, is where the Lord came to him and he penned the book of Revelation. Revelation, by the way, it's not with an S. The book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus. Can you imagine the honor the, to suffer like the Lord and then be banished to this little island and then pen the revelation of Jesus that predicts the future and how the world's gonna end? You had the honor to pen it down? <laughs> and we still read it today. And many of you Bible nerds, that's, that's the only book in the Bible you read is the book of Revelation. <laughs> Suffer. Anybody want to lead? Who are my leaders? You signed up to suffer. I wrote my notes. If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. It's always a cross before the crown. You think about Jesus talking about pain and pressure. He's in the garden right before he knows he's going to go die for the sins of all mankind. 
and he's such under pressure that there's capillaries in his side. He's, he's, he's sweating blood. You talk about pressure. This pain, this pressure as part of the position. First Peter chapter four, I love what Peter says. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through. Some of you are in a season of deep pressure and pain right now. I'm telling you, the Lord can use it as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you, watch this, partners with Christ in his what church? In his suffering. Golly. I'm glad. I'm a partner with Christ in his suffering so that you'll have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to the world. O.C. just had this great quote. He woke up, I think this week sometime, he said this, and correct me if I'm wrong here, he said, pain and pressure will either pummel you or propel you. It's all about your perspective. I was like, Mike, that preaches. And I'm sorry, I just stole that. I just gave it to them as a preface for when you wanna preach that, okay? <laughs> that is beautiful. It's all about the perspective. And we gain that perspective in prayer. So good. So, it's this suffering. Good leaders, they, they know how to suffer. And so this, this, this request is made by the mom and the boys. <laughs> and then look at uh, 24. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They were hot. They were mad. And I was studying that. I'm like, I wonder why they were so mad. I think it's because those guys beat them to the punch. I don't think they're, I think they're like, oh, why do we think of that, man? I wanted to be on the right and left. You, you just, when you read the, the gospels, they're always talking about who's the greatest and, you know, they're always kind of jockeying for position. I know none of, none of us ever do that, of course, but these guys, they do. So number one, they know how to suffer. Number two, they know how to serve. Look at verse 25, Matthew 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them together and said, okay, boys, all right, we got this request. There's some division. You guys are mad at each other. Let's rally up, and I got a leadership lesson for you. You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people. You give me that coffee now and do this and do that. And officials, they flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will, this, is, this is what hit me. This is why I had to change and go to this Bible study. Among you, it will be, come on, everybody together. Among you, it will be different. different, different. It's not like at your office going the way the world and it's like just stepping on people under you. The, the greatest leader is the one who serves. It's a complete shift, man. It's a total shift. It's Jesus is flipping the world upside down. Among you, it'll be different. It's a different kind of leader. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, I like that. He's not poo-pooing, by the way, the desire to do something good for the Lord, to be in leadership. It's a great thing, he says. But if you want to be a leader, you must be a servant. And then 27, whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. If you circle the word for servant, it's actually the word diakonos, which means one who executes the command of another, master, servant, attendant, minister, waiter, one who serves food and drink. I always say this, you want to prepare for ministry, go get a job waiting tables. And when you serve with joy in your heart and love, and you don't get a thank you, in fact, they just judge you because the food didn't come out in time and you just still have a smile on your face, that's good training for ministry right there. Bring the food, bring, serve, unconditional love is flowing through you. You wanna train, that's, that's the way you wanna do it. You serve. And then the word for slave is doulos or doulos, which I named my first dog because it says devoted to another, to, to the disregard of one's own interest was the exact opposite of my dog. I was just praying that over him, though, and it never came to light. <laughs> Boy, I love Jesus. He said, this is leadership. 
It's, it's upside down. It's, it's flipped all around. It's, it's a servant. You remember Jesus before the night he was betrayed, what did he do? He took his boys before dinner. He took off his robe. He knelt down and he washed his disciples' stinky, gnarly, jankety feet. No, no, no clip, clip toenails. Those things were gnarly all over the place. He gets down on his knees. And by the way, one of them was Judas Iscariot, who he knew was going to betray him. And he still got down on his knees and he served them. The lowest form of humanity at the time was the servant who just washed feet. Jesus, the CEO of the universe, stoops down and he washes their feet. And God's been speaking to me. Todd, you call yourself a pastor. You call yourself someone who loves me unconditionally, loves others. The people that are the Judases in your life, can you still love them exactly the way I love them? Well, the guys that are kind of nice to me, I can, but the person that just stabbed me in the back and talked a bunch of stuff about, I don't know, that's a whole nother level. And God's like, great, now you can continue to grow as a servant of the most high God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the great opportunity to grow. But I don't want to, but too bad. You're called to suffer and you're called to serve. I love uh, the story of Greg Laurie. He wanted to be a pastor and he came to Pastor Chuck years ago when the first Calvary Chapel was getting going. He's like, I want to be uh, you know, a pastor. I'm, call, I'm called to it. And Chuck called his, his assistant, Romaine. And Romaine came over and, and Chuck said to Romaine, hey, Greg wants to be in ministry. He's called to be a pastor. Can you help him? And so Romaine's like, yeah, no problem. And he took Greg and he walked right to the, the utility closet and gave him a broom and a mop. He said, welcome to ministry. Come on. Ministry 101. That's the word right there. It's, it's diakonos. It's, it's a doulos. It's someone that serves. Our associate lead pastor, Mike O'Connell, felt called to ministry. One of my friends challenged him, said, hey, bro, like he's out in California. You feel called to be a minister? Go, go move to Omaha and start serving and start studying the word of God. See what God might want to do. He didn't have a job. He didn't have a place to live. The dude just rolled in. I was leaving for vacation and one of our guys that was leading the setup team at Millard North at 6 a.m., moving the trailer, moving the church in and out, a very glorious position, by the way, okay? And uh, I'm leaving. I'm like, hey, I need a leader to go show up and get everything in order. You, you, you cool with that? He's like, whatever you need, sir. Shows up, builds a team, faithful, never missed one, was early, built the team, and they loaded in and out, and there was never, I don't there was none of that. It was servant. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's the next pastor I need to hire right there. That's the guy I want around me. This is leadership right there. And man, it goes into so many different areas. It's not just leading in the church, it's leading in your family. I ran into a couple. We were at a board meeting in Fort Lauderdale. We were part of this church, leading this church years ago. And I ran into this couple and I didn't even know it, but I challenged people, uh, couples. Here's, you want some practical advice? Servant leadership in your home. Before you go to bed at night and you're about to brush your teeth, which I trust that you do brush your teeth and you're married, take some toothpaste and put it on your spouse's toothbrush first before you put it on your own. And then make sure you put it on your own, okay? And then I said this to this couple and I hadn't spoken to them in 16 years. And this guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, bro, I just want you to know I'm still putting toothpaste on my wife's toothbrush first. And I looked at him, I was like, what? He's like, I'm happily married. I'm still serving in the church 16 years later. Thank you for challenging me to be a servant. And I was like, oh, open the door for your wife. Don't open it before. It's always awkward because then you get, there's a snow pile and, the, and, and she's like, just let me open. I'm like, just Open it for what? What happens? There's a there's a servant mentality that begins to build in the little things and the practical things, and now we're serving like Jesus, and it's different. It's different. Okay. Last one: suffer, serve, sacrifice. And we could have just skipped to this verse, and we would have walked away, all of us, with a great leadership lesson. This one verse. Matthew twenty twenty eight. Here it is. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And this is what hit me. 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. You want to lead? You want to be the big boss? Give your life. Jesus literally gave his life. And most of us, we're not going to have to go to a cross. We're not going to have to go to take a bullet. Some of us will. The majority of us won't. As I was studying this, what the, the question was, was kept on coming back, though. What, what is he inviting us into when it comes to sacrifice in this season? Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I love it. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and what? And gave himself for me. What does it look like to you, leader, to sacrifice in this season? What is the Lord inviting you into? As you're in his word, as you're in worship and you're in spirit, you're hearing from his spirit, you're in community and you're praying for one another. What is he really putting on your heart? If I'm really honest, there's some seasons of my life that I get complacent and I get stuck and, and now God puts me in the precarious position. And what is he doing? He's drawing me closer to him and growing me as a leader to get more uncomfortable. We have a saying around the church. We say, embrace uncomfortable. Why? Because when we're uncomfortable, we're growing as a leader. So what is it? In your family, at school, on your team, in North Omaha, in India, in Elkhorn, wherever God's sending you. What does sacrifice look like? Some of you right now, he's asking you, inviting you to sacrifice some of your time to host a group in your home or to, to show up to a group. He's saying, I want you to sacrifice some of your time to honor me, but also it's going to be a blessing to you. You feel stale and stuck, but man, as you sacrifice some of your time, your life starts opening up because living is giving. It's a totally different thing that happens. Some sacrifice your treasure by making a meal for a neighbor and then walking over and asking how you can pray for them as you drop the meal over at their house. Some of y'all got the gift of baking bomb cookies. Sacrifice some of your skills in the kitchen for the glory of God and the betterment of your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Some will sacrifice comfort by moving across the world to share the gospel and serve the poor. And I'll land with this, this story because it really connects with where we're at right now. There was a couple years ago, over 30 years ago, that felt the Lord inviting them into a season of sacrifice. They lived here in West Omaha. He was a chemical engineer making good money and building a family. And he just felt the Lord calling him to overseas missions. And he just felt the Lord said, sell everything and follow me. Kind of like the dude, Matthew, at the tax collector office. Drop your nets and follow me. And so he did. He, he sold everything. And he's waiting to like, okay, Lord, where are we going? Where are we going? Over the seas, overseas. And as they prayed and they fasted, the Lord's like, actually, it's not going to be overseas, but just uh, down the road into North Omaha. And I'm called you to go and bring your family to North Omaha and just be a blessing, be a, be a minister to serve and to lead in North Omaha. And if it wasn't for his yes, we wouldn't be meeting on their campus at 5 p.m. today to sacrifice a little bit and see what God might want to do in North Omaha. Crazy. So I ask you again, what does a leader look like? What's a great leader look like? What do you look like as a leader? What do I look like? What a beautiful picture. The greatest leader of all time, Jesus Christ. Suffer, serve, and sacrifice for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. God, thank you for this word. Really refreshing and challenging for me. <laughs> Jeez. So good. And I needed it. So thank you. And I pray that this helped continue to point people to you. Keep us on track with what a true leader looks like. Forgive me, God, when I've gotten off track, distracted, maybe had a 
a wrong perspective of what a leader looks like and we wanna humble ourselves before you and say, God, yes, we wanna lead, empowered by your spirit, your way. Those working through a season of pain, I pray you would comfort them. God, I pray that the servant leaders in this church would break this huddle and serve others in our community. And as we sacrifice and we send it to North Omaha and different parts of the country and the world, we wouldn't be striving, wouldn't be settling, we'd be walking in your spirit and say, whatever you wanna do, God, we're open. We're all in.